everybody how's everybody doing again uh, my apologies again i just want to apologize for coming on uh late than post uh please count that to my uh my head and not my heart uh but got a little confused i'm in different time zones so i was thought i had a good time but no i was an hour behind so uh, again just count that to my my uh, my heart and not my uh head so um but but with all that being said, man, thank you guys so much for for tuning in. Uh, man, we're just doing some things, trying to continue to elevate, take things to a new level. Uh, and uh, give me one second to uh, uh, do some things and and we'll be ready to go. So let me know where you're tuning in from. Make sure you share this. Make sure you let people know that you're watching. Um, and this week, as you see, man, I'm going live from from the conversation 98 page as well as my personal page so we're just trying something new trying to make sure it make it make sure that it's easy as possible uh, and, and to get it out there but again make sure that you go to uh on youtube on the proper i mean the conversation 98 uh youtube page uh as so you can uh uh share that as well but again i'm sharing this with uh with a few people and once I get that shared, hey, just let me know where you're tuning in from. And so we can get right into this topic tonight, uh, because tonight is, is another great topic. And uh, and I'm just I'm just excited. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about another opportunity, another week. I'm excited to just for health. I'm excited for um, just for a lot of things, man. Most of all, I'm just excited about just being alive and being free, uh, being um and really being grateful, being grateful. I would say that, yeah, I'm excited about being grateful more than anything. Um, but again, man, um, welcome to the conversation 98. We are on episode 78, 78. That means we've been going pretty strong for a while. We've been going pretty strong for a while. And I'm thankful for that. i uh, sharing this a little bit more. Uh, with a few people. And as I share it, hey, it is what it is. Make sure you share it. Make sure you let people know that we're in the building. But again, my apologies for the delay. I know that it's supposed we supposed to came on at five o'clock central, six o'clock eastern. But um, hey, you know, I am in central time. And I was thinking I was <laughs> I was thinking I was uh, on eastern time. And my just my time, I realized that I was an hour behind. But forget all of that. That's on me. How you doing, Miss Dorothy Jones? Thank you for tuning in all the way from Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, Arizona. Hey, again, man, I'm so excited. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to talk, man. I'm ready to talk. Ready to get on this conversation, uh, and ready to really do a deep dive on this because I really feel the night conversation again is one that if we take heed, if we take heed to it, I think that it will really help us. Uh, really, really help us um, as we navigate through this four-letter word called life. And help us put put ourselves in positions to be in better positions to uh, make better decisions for our life, and hopefully the outcome in our lives and things changes in our life. Because the reality is this: you know, nobody got it all figured out, and we need each other. We need each other. Uh, we need each other more than what we know. And I think people need, uh, as far as we being honest and transparent, I think that is more helpful than a lot of people would give credit to or credit for. With all of the pleasantries being said and done. Um, just want to jump right into it. Just go ahead on and jump right into it. So episode 78, 78, uh, they said, you know, the title, what we're going to talk about is, you know, you did wrong, but you are too selfish to change for the better. I say that again, you know that you did wrong, but you are too selfish to change for the better. Now, why did I want to, I, I, I sat and I contemplated and I really didn't get the, the subject of, of what I wanted to just kind of talk about tonight and have a conversation with everybody tonight is about, you know, what is, and it came to me yesterday as I was just sitting down and just in, 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 in thought, I was sitting down thinking like, you know, the re, a lot of us, we know in a lot of areas in our life, we know when we're wrong. We're, we know exactly that we're wrong. We know exactly what we're doing wrong. We know how we're doing it. We know when we're doing it. But a lot of us are just too selfish to change for the better. And what I mean by being too selfish to change for the better. What when I mean by being being dead wrong, we know we dead wrong and being too selfish to change for the better is the, the, the reality that we know for a fact what we're doing is not right. 
that is not bringing forth the uh, 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 we're just not doing right by people, doing right by things, doing right by organizations. We're just not doing right. But we're so prideful and we're so selfish that we just say, you know what? I know I'm wrong, but I'm just not going to change. And we will sit there and we'll wait around to somebody else even come around. And, and, and matter of fact, we will we would allow others to uh, we allow others to um, we, we will be in that moment, in that moment of selfishness. We will put others at risk to 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 experience some hardships simply because we don't want to be on a be be mature enough to take ownership of the fact that we are wrong and i know one of the hardest things and and, and i say this you know um uh, one of the hardest things to to do for an individual when you start talking about really at levels of maturity one of the hardest things to really acknowledge and take ownership is the fact that we're wrong you know and it's so funny that as i think about it as i think back about it even when you go back to in the book of genesis in the bible when, when God gave um, um, Adam and Eve the instruction, do not eat from the tree that the knowledge of good and evil. When God came back after they ate and he was looking for them, they was hiding from him. When God said, hey, Adam, where are you? Adam said, we was hiding. And God was like, why are you hiding? Adam was like, you know, we were naked. God was like, how you know you naked? And then it got down to they ate from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But even in that moment, even in that moment, Adam came back and said, he didn't take ownership of his action. He got the instructions, but he never took ownership. And he said, the woman you gave me, and he tried to put the blame on somebody else. So it shows that our nature, human nature is to blame somebody else, but we can break that. We can break that. And I say that again, we can really break that by really being taking ownership of the things and the decisions that we make in our lives. I got my mom tuning in from good old snowy Fort Drum, New York. And Belinda is watching all the way from Greensboro, Alabama. So I get, I bring you guys greetings from Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, I've been here, be leaving here uh, after the weekend, heading back to the nice and warm Fort Drum. But with that being said, I just wanted to just put that out. But thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching. But I wanted to talk about that level of selfishness. And it shows in that, even in the Genesis, in the beginning, when we talk about the Bible, shows that our human nature, and that was right after sin had came, and man, sin was entered into the world through disobedience by Adam. The first thing sin did was it blamed somebody else. And the funny thing is, it, it always seems to be that way. It always seems to be that way. So when we're talking about a word, so I say this, when we're talking about a word that nobody really like to talk about now, sin always point the blame at somebody else. Sin, sin will lead you to do an act but then also convince you not to take responsibility for the consequences for that for the, the choices that you made. It will convince you to do the wrong thing, but then convince you also to try to deny it. And that's what I, I will get into what I want to talk about tonight is that you know you did wrong, but we become too selfish to, to change for the better. And that selfishness is really rooted in what we, we know we wrong. We just don't want to change. We don't want to do better because guess what? We want everything around us to compensate for our choices. We want everything around us to compensate for our decisions. We want everything around us to take up the slack and do the extra work before for the for the choices that we make all because we are too cowardice to take ownership and stay up to the plate for the things that we've done that's just what it is i mean it really is that way it really is hey miss page banks how you doing how you doing thank you for tuning in again but that's what i really wanted to get to because this is stuff that if we really sit down and think about it this stuff that we all deal with this stuff that we all go through all did we we all have been wrong we all know listen there's something that we wrong about right now there's something uh um there's something that we are dealing with right now there's something that in our lives within a relationship there's something that we know that we are doing wrong but we just don't want to change we just don't want to change it is if we take inventory right now if we take inventory of our life right now, there's some something in a relationship. There's something that some 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 between somebody that you know. There's something that you have done wrong with, that done wrong by, that you know you have done wrong by, 
and you have said to yourself that you are not going to change simply because you don't want to. And you know you have the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to choose to be better. And this is not about being a better person like a lot of people talk about. That's not what I'm talking about because everybody want to talk about all oh, turn the other cheek. I'm not saying that. I'm not dismissing that. But what I'm saying is, why are we putting ourselves in position to continue to deal with degradation by choosing to just be prideful and know we're dead wrong instead of just saying, I'm going to choose to do right? And that's all I'm saying. We have that power to make that choice. And that choice lies with us. It lies with us and nobody else. And we can we can we can want other people to be there with us. We can want other people to do better, do those things with us. We can want and we can desire that all day. But the reality is this. The reality is majority of the time when it when it comes down to not, not the majority of the time, you have to give an account for the choices that you make. Now, with all of this, with, with, with this whole conversation, uh, one of the things that uh, I, it came to my mind, I say, you know, with this, with this whole conversation about, you know, you know, you're dead wrong and you are too selfish, uh, but you are too selfish to change for the better. It made me think about the prodigal son and both of the sons. I want to talk about both, but I want to talk about the younger son. The, he was dead wrong in his approach to his father. He was dead wrong because he approached his father as if his father was already dead when he said, give me what, what's due me. That's already just looking at his father like his father's already dead. That's the stuff his father earned. He didn't earn that. He had a sense of entitlement out of his selfishness. And out of that sense of entitlement, it emboldened him to go and be extremely disrespectful to his father. And as he was disrespectful to his father, what ended up happening is it led him to a point to where he got he, he filled himself up and he went out there to live a life out of this uh, out of a form of disrespect and pride to the point where he got to a point to where he had to come to himself. And the, the sad thing is when 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 he, quote unquote, came to himself, he had lost everything that he didn't even earn. He lost everything that he didn't have earned. He lost what, what, what his prideful self felt like he was entitled for and was disrespectful to his father, for his father to give him what, he, what his share would be if his father was dead. And he went out there and the Bible said he lived frivolous living. He turned up. He was having a great time. He had all them people with him. And this is the funny thing. When you walking in rebellion, when you walking uh, in, in those things, when you're walking in rebellion, when you're walking in the things of your entitlement and your selfishness, you will always have a crowd around you. You will always have people with you that, that's quote unquote gaslighting you to continue to walk in that foolishness. They are only there to benefit from the things that they can get from you. They're not there for the betterment of who you are. They're not there for the betterment of your growth or you as an individual. They're just there for the turn up. They're just there for the party. they just there for you to make it rain. They just there for you to buy their drinks in the club. They just there for you to do all of these things. They're not there for you. And you will always find these people that easily attach themselves to you. They easily attach themselves to the things that you're doing. And you, you, you feel like they with you. But in the end, you'll find yourself lonely. You'll find yourself broke. And you'll find yourself out there flapping, looking for where these people at. And that's just how life is. Ms. Page Bank said, in some cases, we know we are wrong, but who's going to say I'm wrong because my last name carry a lot of weight? <laughs> so no one is going to say anything, and neither am I. I don't have to change. You know what, Ms. Page, man? I'm glad you brought that up. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, the reality is this. You don't have to change. You don't have to change at all. But I would tell you, out of your, out of your decision to not change for the better, and out of your decision to continue to walk in pride and continue to walk in selfishness, you don't have to change. But those that are connected closer to you will reap the benefit that will reap will reap the consequences of your decision not to choose to change for the better. And and we can sit there all we want to and walk with our chests out. Some people will go to their grave just not to even say, you know what, I need to change for the better. And we will put our kids, we will put our family, we will put our loved ones through hell and high water all because of our pride and we don't want to change for the better. And we be knowing we dead wrong. 
I'm talking about we know we did wrong. When I say we know we did wrong, we know we did wrong from the rooter to the tutor, but we have convinced ourselves and we put our roots down and we said we ain't going to change. And our loved ones connected to us suffer for it. They suffer for it. They suffer for it. Many, many people right now are living in the reality, in the consequences of their decisions that they made in rebellion, of the decisions that they made because they knew that they was dead wrong and they didn't want to change. They didn't want to change for the better. So they continue to walk in that. They walk in that and then now they want to blame everybody else for the realities of their choices. It's the reality of your choice why your life situation is the way that it is now. It's a reality of your choices may be why some of the dysfunction in your family continue to go on. It's a reality of your choices. It is. You can blame everybody else, but you didn't want to change for the better. And I'm not talking about, um, and, and I just want to, I just want to make this clarity. I'm not talking about uh, traumatic things that other people did to you. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about the things of this. You know, they say hurting people hurt people. And the reason why hurting people hurt people is because majority of them don't process that hurt and that pain. And they begin to, a lot of them become the very thing that they hurt them. If they become what they hated. They become what, what hurt them. They manifest into that because they refuse to deal with it and acknowledge it. And what they end up doing is they end up projecting that same hurt and pain on those close around them. And that be on their kids, that be on their loved ones, that be on they, uh, uh, the people at their job. And then those same people sit around and wonder, like, why in the world? They, 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 it's, they always play the victim role. And they live their life. They live years and years and years of living that way and never wondering why their life would never seem to move forward. They, 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 never want, they, they never can figure out why my life is not seeming to move forward. And the reason why it's not seeming to move forward is you are not taking ownership for the things that you know you dead wrong on. And you can change for the better. You know you wrong. I mean, know you wrong. And 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 it's really it's really it's really sad. You know, one of the saddest things, and I say one of the saddest things about it is when people know they're wrong, the first thing that they try to do is they try to find anything that they can to justify them staying wrong. And the sad truth is it doesn't matter even you find something that's quote unquote justifiable. You're still wrong and you still have the power to change for the better. Because it's not just about you proving that you're right. It's not just about you proving that you're right. You can be right and be dead wrong in how you're proving it. So what good is it being right when you go by doing it in the wrong, wrong way? Why are you trying to justify something that you can just change? Why? Just because you want to feed your own ego, just because you want to just say, hey, look, you know, I'm this and I'm that. No, nah, that's stuff for the birds, man. And this ain't no little kid stuff. I'm talking about grown folks. You know you're dead wrong, but you justify it. You, you look for anything to justify and you dead wrong. Dead wrong. And then watch this. The, the, we, we be dead wrong. And we don't even realize the consequences for the stuff that we do. We don't realize that. You know, we, we don't realize that at all. For example, I'll say this. For example, a lot of us be dead wrong and we're angry at our baby daddy or our baby mama. And we project that anger and that frustration on the kids by how we treat them or how we use the kids as pawns. In that, in that relationship, all because we angry. And then now our kids grow up and they got bitterness and they got rage against another parent, all because of the dysfunction of that one parent. You know you dead wrong for that. That kid, listen, that kid ain't had nothing to do with you hooking up with that parent. You did that. You made that decision to lay down. You did that. You conceived that child, so guess what? You made that decision, and you can't go back and change who that child parent with. Yeah, they can go and make other decisions in their life, but you going around and you trying to justify what you're doing wrong. You know you holding that kid. You know you want to you want to have a power base. You know you have a, you want to have a power base, and you hold that over that kid's head. You do that. You the one doing that. 
You want to have a you want to control stuff. So now you start using the kids as pawns against against the other parent, all because you want power because you hurt and you feel like if you got the control in the in, in, in the dynamics of the relationship, then you are getting back at them. But you dead wrong. You hurt your, your selfishness is hurting that child. It is. And we don't even realize it. We don't even realize it that our kids see that and they become what they see. So they pass it on to their kids. Now you got generational curses coming through the simple fact that you know you dead wrong and people that are too selfish to change for the better. And it perpetuates itself. And I just use that with, with I use that example of, 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 of a, a, a mother and father because that's a very good one. But it goes on with, with, with things of how you handle uh, stuff in your life. We got a lot of people walking in dysfunction simply because they don't want to make they don't want to change for the better. And they know they can uh, they know they can change for the better. But they just don't want to make that decision. They do not want to say I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. And I just need to change. And a lot of times, man, it's not that big of a thing. It's, 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 it's a lot of times your breakthrough is in the small decisions. Your breakthrough is saying I ain't going to clap back this time. Your breakthrough is saying, you know what? You right. Your breakthrough is saying, you know what? Instead of me being mad, I'll, I'll put my clothes in the in the laundry basket. Instead of, you know, y'all see them, it is in those small things. But the the pettiness and the and, and the sinful nature in us is that we would die on the sword to try to prove a point that don't mean nothing at all. And if we look back at it, it doesn't mean nothing at all. And it's really sad. You know, I was uh, I was approached. I was approached. Uh, I was approached. I was a, I was approached by somebody um, this week and they asked me a question. And the question that they asked me was, you know, how do I deal with stress? And it really made me think about it. Right. And then one of the things I started thinking about is like, dang, um, as far as with stress, I don't have a lot of quote unquote stress in my life. Because I've learned to manage certain things and I learned to put things in perspective. And one thing, the reason why I don't have a lot of stress in my life is, is because I've conditioned myself to, to accept the reality that if I can't change something right now myself, then I'm not going to waste my time, energy and resources uh, to, 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 to focus on that when I can't bring about a change to that right now. So it does me no good to waste time and get my anxiety up and all this thing about something I can't impact or, or I can't affect change to. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to be concerned about it or not have it in my to do list, but I'm not going to overwhelm myself about what ifs on things I can't even do nothing about. You know, the other thing about it is perspective. I would tell you a lot of things that have helped me and I say through my life is being able to travel, being in the military and seeing certain things, living in different countries, being in different, seeing things that gave me perspective. One of the things I talk about it, I've talked about it before and I talk about it again. Uh, and, it, and it really, really uh, resonates uh, with me is I can remember my second deployment to Iraq in 2006 to 2007. And I was on a military transition team where I was embedded. It was 10 Americans embedded into our, uh, a 500 Iraqi, a 500 man Iraqi, Iraqi infantry battalion. And this was during the time of the surge where, you know, we was doing a lot of surge to quote Baghdad in the Baghdad area. Well, I was there in Baghdad and part of our area where we had, we had our Iraqi army guys and they was providing security. And in the area where they were providing security was, there was this landfill that was right off the uh, freeway to overpass. And in the landfill, they had people, families that had built their houses in the landfill. They built it in the landfill because they said that it was, it was more safer for them to live among trash for them, for them and their families than to live in certain neighborhoods. And that gave me a powerful perspective on how we have our quality of life is in the States and how much we complain about stuff. That gave me a powerful perspective and that made me more appreciative of, of the things that I had. And, and that made me think about that even in the States, if we don't have Wi-Fi or we don't have um, uh, Starbucks or we don't have 
a lot of their comforts and things that we have grown accustomed to. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying that. I appreciate that more than anything. But it's our perspective of how we view things. It really helped me look at things where if I'm appreciative that I have a place to stay. And I think that a lot of that has been lost in the abundance that we've had and then in the, in the sacrifices and in the blessings that a lot of people have sacrificed for us that a lot of our way of living is different. My way of living is different from my grandfather and my grandparents, how they grew up. My way of living was different. My way of living was different. My quality of life was different of how my parents grew up. And yes, that's a result of some of, the, some of their choices that they made in life. But a lot of that perspective is lost because of how how we how we uh, 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 approach things, and 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 a lot of times with that perspective, we can we can become entitled and forget where we came from, and in a lot of times in that if we overlook those things about what we know we be wrong at because of our abundance. And, and it's funny how easy we can take things for granted and how easily we can become entitled to things. And that goes, goes back to what I was talking about with the prodigal son earlier. The prodigal son looked at what his father's wealth was and said, you know what? I'm not even willing to allow you to die before I get my portion. Just give me what's due to me right now so I can go on and do my own thing. And the, the, just think about that. Think about how disrespectful that is. Like, I don't even care that you die. I, I ain't even got the I ain't even got the patience to wait till you die before I get what, what's owed to me. Give me mine now so I can go do my own thing. Not nothing that he earned. He ain't earned none of that. He ain't do none of that. He just felt like he was entitled to it. He was dead wrong and he was too selfish to see that. Because he felt like, okay, his name was on it, even though he didn't earn it, he felt like he did it. Now, I go to say that goes to say this. And I wanted to bring this up, you know, how many people that we know have that same mindset of selfishness that the prodigal son had, that same mindset of entitlement that the prodigal son had, that they look at people and they take what people do for them for granted. And they wish that uh, and they very disrespectful, like like some people supposed to do things for them. And they be dead wrong and they can't see because they're blinded by their own selfishness. They can't see that the issue lies with them. And the only thing they really have to do is change their perspective. Now, the sad thing is this. The prodigal son received all of that. The father blessed him and he went off on his own. And the Bible said he lost everything down to the point to where he got so low. He got so low to the point that he said, you know what? He was about to eat the same slob that hogs was going to eat. And the Bible said he came to himself. That means that he sat down and realized, man, I'd rather go back and be a servant at my father's house than to live the life that I'm living now. And it all was from him having that nasty attitude and that sense of entitlement. And he went back and the Bible talks about how uh, the father received him in open arms. Um, and that leads me and, 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 that, and, and, and he was received back in his rightful, rightful place. Watch this. He didn't deserve what he was received back. And I like that story, how that part of the story talks about, you know, how the father received us back and how, you know, uh, 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 God received us back. And I even talked about that on my album on, on my song, Come Back. And that's what I talk about. Come back to the father. You know what I'm saying? Um, that that, that it, it, we can come back. You know, I've been the prodigal son. I've been that person that wanted to go out and do my own thing and had that sense of entitlement and, and was very disrespectful in my thinking because guess what? I was going to do it my way. I was going to do how Shep did it. I was going to do it. I was going to write my own life and write my own books. And I got out there and realized everything that I, I thought I wanted wasn't what I needed to keep me fulfilled. So when I got out there, I realized that it would left me empty inside and I came back home and God received me back with open arms. But the other side to this, I want to talk about the other person. I want to talk about that other person. The other person was the brother, the brother that stayed back. And that brother that stayed back was still selfish in his own right. And he was dead wrong because his mindset was he felt like just because he stayed, he felt entitled like he, he deserved more. He was mad because, Dad, why are you? Throwing all this stuff and killing this fat, killing these animals to have this feast for this 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 dude that ran away, 
And a lot of us have that same mindset. And that's why I wanted to talk about both of them, both sides of it. Why? Because we can have, we can be dead wrong on no matter what. If we go out and do wrong or we stay home and do wrong, we can be dead wrong. But the reality is we have to make the decision to not to continue to choose to be selfish and change for the better. A lot of our life, a lot of the things that we really want in life, a lot of our marriages, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's sad, but, you know, uh, this is sad, but it is true. You know, all of our marriages are are on the, on the rough because people don't want to make change for the better. And it's small stuff. It's not that big stuff. A lot of our, our families, the dysfunction in our family is, is right there to be changed for the better and to blossom, but we don't want to change for the better. A lot of a lot of the trauma and hurt and pain that we are causing people through neglect and, and our choices and how we live our lives are right there to be changed. But we don't want to change for the better. And it's not those big things. It's not the big things. It's the small things. It's the I'm going to choose to be considerate. It's the I'm going to make time. It's the you know what? I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to honor you. You know what? I'm going to be appreciative. You know what? I'm going to be more grateful. You know what? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't take all of that. It doesn't take that big, big, those big things. It's the small stuff. That's where a lot of our breakthroughs are found that, but we just don't want to do the work to manifest it. We don't want to do the work. Um, my mama said, how can you yell if you are selfish? Oh, you can yell. <laughs> you can yell. You definitely can yell. My mom also said, what if you think that someone else is selfish? Now, I'm glad you asked that question because the reality is this. This is a reality that that I don't care how, how who you think you are or what you think you are. This is a reality. The reality is that we all are selfish and we all have the potential to do some nasty stuff. We all. And we all have selfish moments. We all have selfish things that we do. And we all have to have to monitor our level of selfishness because it is naturally to be selfish. And what I mean by selfish is uh, you think you considering yourself first at the expense of others. Um, that's what I mean by selfish. And, and, and my mama asks, how can you tell if you are selfish? You can tell if you are selfish, if what you are doing is benefiting you at the expense of others, that's how you can tell you selfish. That's really how you, I don't care how you slice it, whatever you're doing, if it's at the expense of others and not the expense of you and somebody else is paying for it emotionally, financially, or whatever, whatever that bill is, it goes to somebody else, you are being selfish, period, point blank. I don't care how you slice it, you are the one being selfish. That's what it is. And, 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 and dealing with that is a lot of times we just don't want to, we just don't want to change. That's just really what it boils down to. Somebody hurt us. Somebody hurt you. Somebody did something to you. And we'll sit there and we'll hold on to that thing for 20, 30 years. All because we, our selfishness, want them to feel what we felt or not only feel what we felt, but um, uh, experience what we experienced. When the sad reality is they may never experience what you experienced. They may never Feel, felt what you felt. And you sitting out here put, placing your forgiveness and placing your black breakthrough, conditioning it on if they do something that you want. If they doing something that you want. You know, I, I, I would say this, one of the greatest, one of the, um, one of the greatest experiences that I had was the, uh, forgiveness. And me choosing to forgive for something that was done to me and something that was done to me that was hurtful. I mean, hurtful, hurtful to the core. Not going to go in details. I would just tell you it, it, it was it was so hurtful that it rocked uh, my the, my it rocked my faith. It rocked my very being. It rocked me to the core. And I felt the, the unction of the Holy Spirit to uh, have me forgive. And I didn't want to forgive. I want that. I wanted that individual I wanted those people to feel exactly how I felt. I ain't want to show no mercy. I wanted them to feel exactly how I felt until the Holy Spirit reminded me that it, he reminded me is that, Robert, you can continue to live your life in unforgiveness, 
but you'll be walking around carrying all this extra heavy weight, wearing yourself out to death to no avail, and you still won't find the peace that you think you get. And with that, what that did was I made a decision and watch this. And I talked about this before, about a year ago on this show. I made the decision to forgive, but it took my heart about three years to catch up with my logical decision to forgive. And I think a lot of times that's what we get caught with being dead wrong is we want the time to be instantaneous. But a lot of times uh, the, 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 it's a process. Not a lot of times. It is a process. It's a process how we go through doing things. But when we dead wrong and we know we wrong, we just uh, um, uh, you, you you just you just got to deal with it. Uh, my um, uh, Miss Belinda said, "When you let it go, you feel so much better." That is so true. That is so true. When you let things go, but you got to get to your like this is like this is a growth thing. This is a growth thing. This is a process thing. Um, and I'm glad that you made that that comment. So when you choose to let things go, especially hurt and pain that people did to you, it's not that you had to first get to the point to where you're not losing. And if you had the mindset that you're losing, that's when you start to feel like, well, you know, you're going to hold on to it. I'm, I'm going to win. I'm going to make sure somebody feel like what I feel. But it's not a loss. It's a lessons learned. And what I mean by that lessons learned is it's a it is a, such a refreshing lesson learned that you realize that you gain more value with letting go than you do holding on. And it's almost like you're sitting there and you're holding these chains and these chains have this big weight and you're holding on and it's pulling the skin and then making your hands callous and it's making your hand bleeding. But you're holding on, you're holding on, you're holding on. But when you let it go, first of all, you realize that your hand is free and it's not in pain. Now you can start treating your hand and allowing your hand to heal. So now you can start to, by your hands healing, your hands are free. Now you can really start receiving the gift that God wanted to pour into you for the things that you lost. And, and when you start doing that, you start to re, you start to realize that the very thing that I thought I lost, God just made room for me because I chose to let go. He made room for so much more so that I can receive. And I know that's hard. That's hard. That's some hard stuff we're talking about. Because you said, okay, Shep, I hear what you're saying about how that is. Well, that means that, okay, this is how it ties to what we're talking about tonight with being dead wrong and being too sexual for change. When somebody did something to you, somebody did some hurtful to you, right? The first thing we want to do is we want them to feel, we want to hurt them back. We want to get back at them. But now you say, okay, Shep, all right, you're saying that God telling me forgive and let it go. But you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how it made me feel. I can tell you this. I've been in places where I had to. I know what it feels like when somebody do you dead wrong and you start hurt to the point to where you can't even scream and you feel like you got a knot in your voice. I've been hurt to the point to where I've been ashamed for the fact that I knew other people knew what I was going through. I've been hurt before to where I felt a level of betrayal where I had trust issues with dealing with certain people because I felt like they knew about it and they didn't do anything about it. I've been hurt so much before to where I had to sit there and, and, and walk through my own, my, my anxiety levels went up, my depression level went up because I, I, I was so hurt that I had refused to even take it to God because I felt like, God, since you allowed this to happen to me, then how am I going to trust you with giving you this? So I said, I'm going to carry it on my own. And I will tell you, that was one of the worst times in my life where I began to deal with anxiety and, and being overwhelmed with anxiety, where I would be battling suicidal ideations and I was battling depression because I was trying to carry something that it wasn't meant for me to carry. And God had to remind me that even though some people, he, he had to, this is the powerful thing about it. This is what I love about it more, more than anything. In my hurt, when that time that I was, I, I, I stopped trusting God, God had to remind me that of his divine and his powerful will. And what I mean by this is God has a divine will and permissive will. And he said, Robert, my divine will is my will will be done. His permissive will is he give people the choice to choose to walk according to his will for their life or not. Some people would choose to walk along that path. Some people would choose to walk away. 
And what I had to realize was I couldn't control nobody but me. So why am I being mad for other people choosing to, to choose their walk, choose their path? Even though I may have wanted that, that individual to align with me because there was originally an agreement for an alignment. But just because that alignment got off track, that doesn't mean that God's divine will for my life wasn't there. Now, I had to make the decision to choose to stay on track or chase my own thing. And through a lot of hurt, pain and heartache, I ended up staying. And I'm grateful that I stayed because what God did for me is so much greater. Uh, Miss Paige Banks said, letting go gives you peace of mind and you open up for the healing process. This is so powerful. She also said, knowledge is powerful, so powerful when we let go and let God. And one thing I want to say about that is now we got this really start. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And Miss Belinda said, we mess up when we try to handle it ourselves. <laughs> I'm a witness to that. Uh, but one, I'm a witness. One of the things that we have to do when we say things like that, and as believers, one of the things that we have to do is when we say we let go and we let God, we got to start giving people the reality of what that looks like. We got to start giving people that those tangible steps that we did, what it looks like, because right now, a lot of times we just say we let go and we let God and it just look like, you know, a whole bunch of hocus pocus, pocus, pocus. But the reality is we live this thing. We walk this thing and this thing. It, it, it's, it's a decision that we make. And those decisions that we make really put us in position to manifest the word of God in our lives by applying the word of God life, by choosing to apply the word of God in our life. That's when we start to see those things happening in our lives. We start to see those things change. We start to see our mindset change as we work towards that. I mean, those things right there, it, it, it's tangible things that go along with our faith walk. It is tangible things that go along with what we say we believe. It's not just we just go to church and we hear a word and we come back. No. A lot of times it does, going to church and hearing the word, that's just a, either a confirmation or just a joke. The, the, what really comes is in our commitment to saying, I'm going to choose to apply God's word in this situation. Now, sometimes even in applying God's word, God will give you the wisdom to let you know when to let go. Sometimes you got to cut, cut strings because you can want good for people that don't want good for themselves. And the Holy Spirit will give you, it will give you that insight and let you know, hey, look, it's time to let that go, bro. It's time to cut that relationship off. It's time to get off that job. Hey, it's time for you to stop worrying about them kids the same way you're worrying about them. You raise them, let them trust. Tr First of all, they my kids. Put them in my hand, let me do it. You see what I'm saying? Stop, stop, stop all that stuff. And we, we spend a lot of time on a lot of stuff that God is just saying, hey, give it to me. Give it to me and trust me. Uh, Ms. Page Bank said, when we not that uh, when we know that a person can do something about the pain you are carrying and they don't, that definitely a different kind of hurt because you trusted that person to do right. Oh, that's a different kind of hurt right there. When you know it, when you know it. But that's when you realize, like one thing I realized is. Once I made my mind up to heal in the situation that I was in. Once I really made my mind up to heal, it wasn't conditioned on if somebody or individual would do something. It was conditioned based off of me saying that I don't want to carry this pain no more. And what I started seeing God do was God will he would lead the Holy Spirit would lead me to watch certain things, certain things on uh, TV. I was able to watch uh, certain things on the Internet. I was able to uh, talk to certain people, certain conversations. It was certain Bible studies. It was through reading. God would lead me to read certain things and all of those small little things here and there. Boom, boom, boom. Go to church, go to a service. Somebody will speak on this. I hear this on the internet. I see this post on Facebook. I see this other thing. I see this video. And all these things were just coming, timing together just to encourage me on my walk as I made this commitment to heal. Now, watch this. I still had to manage. I still had to manage the reality of my pain by it being connected to certain people so that in, with that being said, I had to uh, disconnect myself from certain people especially from the person that caused me the pain, I had to disconnect myself from the individual. 
And for a period of time, I only communicated via email or text message. That wasn't being funny. I had to do that to protect myself. That's the logical step on things. It didn't, it didn't just happen to me where, you know, I prayed about it and God came down and boom, he pulled everything and all of a sudden, all in my heart. No, that, that didn't happen overnight. But like I said before, I, I, I made a decision to heal, but it took my heart about two years to catch up to that. To where all my emotions and all that thing, I had to go through that process of it. But because I made that the commitment and that decision two years earlier, God helped me through that. And that's what I want people to understand is that uh, in this process, in our walk, it, it's a process. It's a process that we are encouraged on that journey. We're encouraged by others. We're encouraged by the transparency by others. You know, that's why the word of God said we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. I'm not telling you to tell all your business, but it's some stuff we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about the people that's going through this stuff, dealing with these things. And that's why I talk about this. You know you dead wrong, but you too selfish to change for the you dead wrong. You dead wrong for how you treat your wife. Hey, bro, you dead wrong for that. You are dead wrong for the, the contempt in which you treat your family. You dead wrong for that. It don't matter about what she is or she's not doing. You're dead wrong for that. Yeah, I know what she did to you. Yeah, I know how she make you feel. Or yeah, I know she don't appreciate you. I, yeah, I know all of these. Yeah, I, I got it. I got all of that, bro. I got all of that. But you still dead wrong in your actions. Sister, you dead wrong with how you view your husband. You disrespectful towards him. Because you got a power issue that you got from your mama. And you feel like you got to dominate everything. It got to be your way. And you emasculate him all to feed your own ego, all to feed your own insecurities that was passed down to you by your mama and your grandma, all because they was bitter and they never dealt with the fact that they were dead wrong and made those small changes. So I want you guys to go back and look what I'm talking about when I, when I, what I was talking about earlier and how those things are passed down. Hey, kid, you know you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong for how you've been towards your parents. And you mad? What you mad at? You mad because you ain't getting your way? Oh, well, you know, they disrespectful towards me. Man, shut up. You about to disrespectful towards you. You just don't want, you just feel like that you should be treated. You feel entitled that you should be treated a certain way. And you don't have the, not one sense of, of you don't have one, one day or even understanding what they go through to provide for you and the sacrifices they make for you. But you feel like you ain't getting your way. Y'all see what I'm saying? You dead wrong. And you can change for the better. You feel entitled, but you don't want to get no job. What's wrong with you? Like, these are the things that I'm talking about. These are the things, the mindset that we have. We know we dead wrong, but we don't want to do nothing better. We don't want to make that change for the better. And the change for the better is really better for you, not only for you, but for those close and clo or connected closest to you. Uh, that 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 is a very, very, very uh, powerful thing. Um, and I think that a lot of times we don't maximize that all because we tend to lean to the fact that we are right and we try to justify everything that we're doing. But the reality is, even in our justification, you could be dead wrong. I like, uh, um, I, I will tell you, this is a powerful thing. This right here is a very powerful thing. I can remember when I was going through uh, my situation, um, or I was going through a divorce, and I can remember um, uh, being justified to do something legally. I had legal justification to do something. Literally, I had the legal just black and white. Legally, I could have done something that I had a legal right to do. And the Holy Spirit never gave me a, 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 
It never gave me a piece about what I was going to do because what I was doing was rooted in selfishness. What I was thinking to do was rooted in selfishness. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, nope. And a lot of people looking in was like, man, you should have did that, man. You legally had a right to do X, Y, and Z. Holy Spirit never gave me a piece about it. And I'm grateful to this day that I never chose to walk out and do what I wanted to do from a selfish standpoint. And I was obedient to the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. Miss Page Bank says some may have a power issue. However, a real man of God will help her change by that by letting her know that's not what a woman does in a marriage. Some of us just don't know. I will, and I'm Miss Page Bank. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm I am so glad you brought that up. Uh, and I think that I need to dedicate a whole show to this dynamic. Um, I, I will say this: one of the one of the one of the things that um, that and I, yeah, so one of the dynamics that I've seen and 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 I witnessed over over the years is you know you, we have a lot of single parents in the black community. So with that being said, we have a lot of single parents, and majority of preponderance of those single parents are females are women and the women are raising their kids. A lot of women have done a phenomenal job raising their families, right? So they grow up and the women have to be both parents in the home. She had to be the mother and the father. She had to be the uh, uh, the breadwinner. She has to do a lot of these things that cause her to develop certain characteristics and certain traits that, that are uh, very assertive in nature just due to the nature of the responsibilities and the obligations that she has to fulfill. What that does not consider is it doesn't make it conducive for uh, uh, cohabitation or teamwork because one individual has been used to always doing. So the problem that you typically occurs with that, Miss Page Banks, the problem that typically occurs with that is it's not so much of a fact that a man is trying to show her or they work together towards a common goal, it becomes more so of I've been doing it my way and I have my preferences that I don't want to let down my preferences because in my mind, a lot of the times a woman feel her preference is right and she's been conditioned to doing it her way that it's hard for her to adjust to coming together with what's collectively is better for the group. Now, that doesn't mean that either one way is right or wrong, but you have to be very deliberate about that transition, because if you're not deliberate about that transition, then it can cause chaos because we always revert back to what we're comfortable with. So that's being an assertive where a lot of times you, you're overstepping certain things. And if there's certain things like if we're playing a team sport, if I'm playing basketball, if I'm playing basketball and I'm playing center, I can't try to go out there and do the job of the point guard. I got to allow the point guard to be the point guard. I can cover down if I can step up and be be a backup and, and support, but I I'm, I can't do that job and do my job that I'm supposed to do. And a lot of times, you know, we see people, we see a lot of friction come in those relationships like that is because of, like what you said, a lot of us just, a lot of women just don't know. They, they never were taught how to be teammates, but they were taught how to be leaders. And the reality is this, a true leader can also lead and not be up front. And, and that's a hard transition for a lot of people to know is I'm used to being the one making decisions. I'm used to being the one that everything falls under, but I'm also tired. I'm also worn out and I also seek help. But when the help come, now I'm critiquing everything that the help is doing that's relieving me from the things that I prayed to God for. The reason why I'm critiquing and I'm quote unquote attacking it is because he is not doing it the way I would do it. So that's where a lot of the other things come in. And, and, and yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because Ms. Page, I'm going to talk about that on the show. That's a very inter interesting dynamic that a lot of times we, we, we struggle with because guess what? We don't have those conversations about. We we, 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 we have generations of, of women being raised to be strong and independent, but we ain't, they haven't been raised to be, be partners. And we have generations of men that was raised to be dependent. 
to where now they connect with somebody who's been raised to be independent. They raised to be dependent, but now they, they, they're expected to carry the mantle of being a pro provider and being a provisioner, and they never were taught. And now we have chaos that roots from that. Some, and, and it's all about the mindset with that. So I'm very glad that you brought that up. And that's something, that's a topic that, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to address. I'm going to address that topic, those dynamics, because I really feel like it's a dynamic that really needs to be discussed at length and in a logical perspective and not one where, you know, it's, it's pointing fingers. It's just talking about the reality of what it is, because that's a reality that a lot of people deal with. Because guess what, Miss Paige Banks? It's hard for a woman who's been doing it on her own to allow somebody to come in and trust somebody to do it and trust them to do it that way. When one, she probably have never seen an example or a good example of what it's like to have somebody to work together as a team. So in her mind, she feels as if they need to do it my way because my way is the way that I know how to get it done. And guess what? Uh, 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 and guess what? You ain't doing it my way and your way is wrong. Miss Page Banks said, I was this woman you're talking about. When my husband came along and showed me different, it was so hard to let him leave. However, when we talked about it, we're in this together and he was going to leave. It really eased my mind. So I would say, man, and, I'm, I'm, and me and my mom talked about this. My mom talked about how she literally fought against my father leading um, in a sense, not controlling because see, we got to we got to wipe away all of that buffoonery that the uh, <laughs> the society has put out there. But in the context of a, a, a Christian uh, marriage, you know, when you're talking about the covering, you know, my mom fought against my dad covering. She said she fought it for over 20 years. And she said when she finally submitted herself to it, she said they was able to accomplish more in the last nine, 10 years together than they was able in the, the first 23, 24 four years together because they was on one accord. And we look at that when we understand leadership, when we understand structure, when we understand the design of God and we walk up under that, God will open our mindset up. God will take away that uh, that hurt and that pain. God will uh, or, or, or take away those insecurities from experiences that we didn't have um, or, or, or things that we desire because a lot of times we come in with these relationships with the mindset, we come in with the relationships that we're viewing it from an ideal and not from examples that we saw. And that idea, not from examples that we saw, that causes a lot of conflict with what reality is. We can have all the theory that we want in the world, but until we experience it or seen it firsthand, that's when we can know the realities of what's going on with it. And the reality is, you know, I can love you, but not like you today. That's a reality. It's not a flex. That's just a reality. A reality is I don't want to have nothing to do with you right now, but I still love you. I still can get you something to eat. I still can provide for you, make sure you good. That's a reality. Those are realities that a lot of us never were taught. We, was never, we were never taught those things. So now when we get into it and we walk into that, and this is shift to a whole thing, shift to a whole nother topic, but it also can go to the to what we talk about now. But when we when we go, when we when we when we walk into those things and we and, and we don't have those uh uh re point of reference to go off of, it's hard because now the enemy can come in and make us feel like we're failing and we are the problem. And we're not failing and we're not the problem, that's just what everybody deal with. Everybody have these things. Everybody have these issues. You know, a lot of times, like me, I grew up in a household where we were we were taught to communicate. And I know that's kind of hard to believe, but we were taught to communicate. We were taught that if you have a conflict, you deal with it. You address whatever the issue is. You address it. You agree to disagree. You get it out on the table and you move on. You got other people that grew up in households that they never talked about anything and they just Never talked about it and moved on. And those things lie under mine. With me, that bothers me. Hey, let's talk about it. Let's address it. 
It doesn't matter because guess what? I was I grew up in a house where I was taught con all conflict is not confrontation. It's confrontational. In order to resolve something, you have to confront it. In order to solve a problem, a mal problem, you have to confront it. Two plus two, oh, I ain't gonna do nothing. No, I got to write it down. That's four. I have to confront it. And once I confront it, I can figure it out. Or I can realize that, hey, I was wrong. It was wrong. And I can go back and find a solution to it. So those are the things. Those are the steps. Those are the things. Those are the realities of life. Those are the realities of life that, that we are missing a lot simply because we were never taught about certain things. And simply because we weren't taught, we get our ideas from TV. We get our ideas from, from things that we see. And we get our ideas from the point of reference. And a lot of our point of reference don't align with the things that we want. Listen, if I want to be a millionaire, I need to start hanging around people that are millionaires. I can't hang around with folks that don't know anything about money. This is not a knock on them. That don't mean that I don't love them. That don't mean that I can't hang out with them. But if I'm trying to get somewhere, I need to be at a place where I'm exposed to stuff that's going to get me to where I want to be. So if you if you if you uh, uh, if you trying to have a successful marriage and you come from a family where you had a lot of single single parent homes. You need to connect yourself with people that's doing this thing. And then why you uh, that, that, that are, uh, are having uh, uh, good marriages. And what I mean by good marriage, I ain't saying perfect. I'm talking about you need to connect yourself with people that that you see that are, are transparent and you see how they're communicating. So when you're talking to them, you ain't feeling like, bro, I'm by myself on this. And you start to realize, like, guess what? I'm not. It ain't that bad. Ain't as bad as I thought it was. And that's how the enemy wants us to do. But don't get caught up. Do not get caught up. And you and knowing that you're wrong in something and you know you dead wrong at it, but you refuse to change for the better because you're too selfish, because you're trying to win. And a lot of times we win the battles and we lose the war. You win an argument and you lose your marriage. You win an argument and you lose your job. Was it worth it? Seriously, was it worth it? Well, I told them, like, really, it was it worth it. And then now you're in a prayer line and, and, and you, you want somebody to help you get put some groceries and, and pay your bill all because you were dead wrong and you ain't want to. You was too selfish to say I was wrong and change for the better. I mean, that's just really what it boils down to. And, 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 and the reality of that is that, you know, we have to, we ourselves, we have to take inventory of ourselves and the things that we do and say, and be man and woman enough to admit that, hey, you know what? And I made this post the other day. Sometimes we just got to acknowledge that we are part, we are the issue. The issue is with us. Yeah, somebody else may do something, but the issue with you. You know, it's easy. It's so easy. It's so easy to find something wrong that somebody else that's close to us find what they're doing wrong to justify our bad attitudes and how we think and our stinking thinking. It's so easy to find, well, you know, they ain't do this. What you do? Like, seriously. And we find, I mean, we get petty with that thing. We get petty with that thing. Oh, they ain't drank all the drink. They put this drink in the refrigerator. Like, oh, they left the cup on the counter. Like, really? Like, seriously, really? It, it just don't. We we just got to do better in that department. Uh, I would just say, man, if you know you wrong, if you know you wrong at something that you did or something that you're doing, like dead wrong, uh, don't try to justify it. Don't be too selfish to change for the better. And just say, you know what? I'm just going to do what I need to do and change for the better. And that's what I'm going to do. That right there is what I'm going to do. And once you make that decision, you know, I would tell you, you'll realize that uh, you'll start to see some changes in your life uh, for the better in your life. And a lot of times it's not about proving that you're right. It's about doing what's right. 
I, I let that one marinate. A lot of times it's not about proving that you're right. It's about doing what is right. And when you consistently do what is right, I would tell you, God will open up blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon blessings. And one thing that I found out is that when you have a heart to do, to be a blessing to other people, God, will, God, God has a way of, of, of doing things to restore, to make sure your cup continues to run over in all the areas of your life. But God also has a way to dry your cup up when you have the wrong mindset. And I hope that will marinate in your spirit. Hope that will marinate in your spirit real good. So I want my cup to continue to run as over. I don't want my cup to dry up all because I got the wrong ad, uh, wrong attitude, the wrong mindset. Again, man, thank you guys so much for tuning in, uh, tuning in uh, tonight. My apologies for the, uh, the the time. But hey, look, as we see, we got it going live on my personal Facebook page. We got it going live on the Conversation 9-8 page. Uh, and uh, this video will be uploaded soon to YouTube. So on the Conversation 9-8 channel. Uh, uh, I, I just, I appreciate you guys more than what you know. I'll be giving out some books. So my, my girl, uh, 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 my girl, I, Antha, um, my Antha Euston, she was a guest on this show a few months back. Um, I, I purchased all three of her books and I'll be giving those away, um, probably next weekend. So look forward to that, that, uh, that giveaway. And I thank you guys so much for, uh, tuning in. Uh, Hey, what's going on? What's going on, Mayor Jones? How you doing? How you doing? Uh, hey, look, Mayor Jones, proud of you, man. Thank you for your, your, your recovery. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for the heart that you have for the people. And thank you for your commitment to service. It means a lot. It means a lot. Ms. Page, man, thank you. Great topic. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And you know what, Ms. Page, Bank, I got to talk about that. I got to talk about that, that, that dynamic, uh, what you talked about, uh, it really embracing it, um, because it is something. Uh, deeper than that. And it's a lot deeper than what you, uh, it's a lot deeper on the surface. And a lot of people deal with that, but they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. But I'll say this, man, you guys have a great and wonderful evening. As you see, shout out, man, I'm wearing my uh, New Orleans Pelicans hat. So shout out to Herb Jones doing this thing down there. I just wanted to support him. Um, and, you know, uh, you guys have a great and wonderful evening. God bless.